God has given us the ability to communicate with each other. Most of the time, most of the time we're able to understand each other. We call it language. We can not only communicate what it is that we would like to have for dinner or the noise that the car seems to be making every time we start it up, but we can express what's in our hearts. We can express our feelings and our emotions to each other. We can articulate those thoughts. We can, uh, we can talk about our dreams and our desires, the longings that we have, the hurts, the pain. We can do all of that. But not only do we have the ability to communicate those things, we have the ability to communicate those things accurately and truthfully or inaccurately and falsely. Colossians 3, 9 says, do not lie to one another. Ephesians 4, 15 says, instead, speak the truth in love. But who can we trust to speak the truth? We have all been disappointed more than once. People who we thought were honest and sincere, they've disappointed us. In fact, we've disappointed other people too. Psalm 62, 4 says, They bless with their mouth, but inwardly they curse. It seems like everybody wants to sell us something. Their product, their perspective, their agenda, their version of what the truth is. Who can we trust? The fact is, the Bible tells us in Psalm 58.3 that we are all born liars. It says, these who speak lies go astray from birth. Wow. And when we speak lies, we not only speak for ourselves... Jesus in John 8.44 said, We speak from Satan, the father of lies. Every time we lie, we speak for the enemy. We speak with his perspective. We allow ourselves to be used by him, to be influenced by him, and by a world that's under his control. Jeremiah 9.3 says, Lies and not truth prevail in the land. It's hard to know sometimes where the truth ends and the lies begin, even within the church. Is it truth or is it tradition? Is it truth that's been shaded or misrepresented or exaggerated by lies? It's not just a problem that we have today. As a matter of fact, it's a problem that began in the Garden of Eden, where Satan lied to Eve. And Adam lied to God. Proverbs 6 says, God hates a lying tongue. And we're all guilty. We have all been guilty of a lying tongue. Matthew chapter 5. As Jesus is giving his disciples examples of how to live as his disciples, he addresses the issue of lies and truth by exposing the tradition of the Pharisees, the tradition of twisting the truth and disguising it as truth. Verse 33, Matthew chapter 5, that's where we are this morning. He says, Again, you have heard that the ancients were told that you shall not make false vows. Epiorcheo in Greek. False test- testimony, perjury. We're familiar with that. It says don't knowingly make false or, or misleading statements. Leviticus 19.12 in the Old Testament, God says you shall not swear by my name. You shall not swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of your God. To lie is to profane the name of God. Uh, Chol in Hebrew. To make it common. To make it ordinary. As if it means nothing. He says that's what you do when you lie. You make God as if he is nobody. You treat him with contempt. He's the God of the universe. You treat him like he's nobody when you lie. But instead, Jesus says, verse 33, Fulfill your vows to the Lord 
Orkos in Greek. Bind your words. That's what the word means. Our words are to bind us. The words that we speak should be as valid as if we signed a piece of paper, a document, a legal document in a court of law that says that what we are saying is true. That is what our words are to be. Orkos. It's a rich word. It means uh, actually uh, to surround something with a fence. And that's what our words do. That's what our words are supposed to do, aren't they? Our words are supposed to bind us. We are supposed to be bound by our words. Is that how we feel about the words that we speak? You know, the words roll off our tongues very easily. Very easily. As Jesus was addressing his disciples, he said that all of the words that you speak, all of the promises that you make, you make before the Lord. You think you're just talking to to your neighbor? To your husband or your wife? At school? At work? He said, no. You are actually speaking to God. He is there as your witness. Psalm 41, the psalmist said, Thou dost see me. Thou dost set me in thy presence forever. We live and breathe and move in the presence of God. That's a comforting thought. That can also be kind of a scary thought, isn't it? We may not want him to hear some of the things that we're saying. How about some of the things that are in our heart? But God is ever before us, and we are ever before him. Numbers 30, verse 2, reminds us that what we promise, we promise before the throne of God, and we dare not violate what we have said, because it says, you shall do according to all that proceeds out of your mouth. We have to remember, Jesus is here speaking to his disciples on a hillside. He's not speaking to the world. He's not speaking to nations. He's not speaking to the unsaved. He is speaking to those who belong to him, his disciples. And he says, these are words for you as my disciples. You who know me, you who have trusted me, you who belong to me. This is the message for you. It's a message for the church. He says, we need to be honest before the Lord. It's kind of hard to ask somebody who doesn't know Jesus Christ to be honest before the Lord, isn't it? It's only us who know him who can be open and honest before the Lord. Everybody else is running. We know what that was like. We ran from God until he pulled us up out of the pit and brought us to himself. And Jesus said, here's how you're you're to live as my disciples. Remember the early church? There was a married couple and they had some, they had some land and they wanted, they sold the land. They wanted to bring the money to the apostle Peter in Acts chapter 5. It says they brought it, but they lied about how much they had sold it for. And Peter said what? He said, you haven't lied to men. He said, you have lied to God. And they both fell down and they were dead before they hit the floor. That certainly would decrease the number of lies in the church if that was the case today. How many times do we casually swear that what we are saying is true? Deuteronomy 6.13 says, If you swear by anything, swear by the name of God. Shabbat, promise, make an oath, make a vow, but make it before him. In both the Old and the New Testament, we find men like Abraham and Jacob and David Paul, Jesus himself, who swore, they made an oath, they called God as their witness to what they were saying. It didn't make what they were saying any more valid, but it certainly did emphasize the importance of what they were saying. And when they said it, they were calling on God to judge them if what they said was not true. They invited God to judge them, to judge their words. Wow, that's enough to stop you from making those vows to the Lord, huh? But as we know, you know, a vow, a promise is only as valid as the person who's making that vow 
or promise. Otherwise, it's just words. Remember when, when uh, Jesus was arrested? He was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they brought him before the re- religious leaders for trial. So we're told in Matthew chapter 26 that Peter followed them from the Garden as far as the court of the high priest. And while he was there warming himself by the fire, people started noticing him and and they thought they recognized him and, and they asked him if he was one of the disciples. He sure looked like one of the disciples. And when he spoke, he had the dialect of a Galilean. He sure spoke like a disciple of Jesus. Jesus was from Galilee. But Peter kept denying him. Verse 74 of Matthew 26, it says, He began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. He began to curse. Katathematizo in Greek. He began to use profanity. It says, and swear. Amnuo. Amnuo. That's not another word for cursing. That's a word for making a vow. Peter made an oath, a vow, that what he was saying was true. He just used profanity to emphasize it. The scribes and the Pharisees had a much more subtle approach to lying. They thought they had found a way around the word of God. How many times do we do we look for those ways around the word of God? We look for those verses, maybe to, to sort of help us get out of something we think. Well, the scribes and Pharisees thought they had gotten out of following God's word. They knew that Deuteronomy 6.13 said that an oath was to be made in the name of God, in the name of the Lord. So they reasoned that if they made an oath without using God's name, that wouldn't bind them. They could lie. They thought they had found a way to lie so that they wouldn't be accountable to God. They wouldn't be accountable for that lie. Their system had become very complex. Difficult to follow. You needed a scorecard in order to follow what they were doing. Matthew 23, Jesus says, You say that uh, if you swear by the temple, you're not obligated to keep your word. But, he says, you say if you swear by the gold of the temple, then you are obligated. He says, "You, you say if you swear by the altar in the temple... You're not obligated to keep your word. But if you swear by the offering on the altar, then you're obligated to keep it. They were making and breaking vows all the time. Who could trust them? They were profaning the name of the Lord. By their words, their hypocritical words, they demonstrated that they didn't value God's word. By their actions, they demonstrated they did not value God. They did not value a relationship with him, and they showed that they didn't even know God. Verse 34 of Matthew 5, Jesus says, enough of this deception. Enough of this behavior that dishonors the God of heaven. He says, I say to you, make no oath at all. Better to make no oath at all than make those kind of oaths. A vow before the Lord was to be something that you set apart to him, something that was special, something that you made in his name, something that you made with an attitude of fear and reverence because you were making it before the God of the universe. Remember, Jesus just had told his disciples in Matthew 5, verse 17, he hadn't come to abolish the law. But woe to those who twist God's word. Woe to those who twist his words to support their lies. Jesus says, don't take an oath, verse 34. Don't take an oath by heaven. He says, it's the throne of God. You don't want to take it by the name of God, but you want to take it by his throne? It's the throne of God. He says, don't take an oath by the earth. He says, it's the footstool of God. He made it. It's his He said, don't take it by the city of Jerusalem. It's the city of the king. He said, everything belongs to God. In heaven, in earth, under the earth, it's all his. He says, you you want to lie and then claim that when you call on these things that belong to God, you claim that they are a witness to your lie? He said, don't do it. 
He said, don't even swear by your head. Verse 36. He said, your head? He said, you can't make one hair white or black. Matthew 10, we're told that God has numbered every hair on our head. Every hair. He can do that because he's the one who's made us. He's the manufacturer. He knows the specifications. He knows how many hairs we have. Jesus said, don't vow by your head. Don't say that you uh, you swear that by your life, that what you're saying is true. He said, don't do that. Why? Remember, he's speaking to his disciples here. He said, because your life isn't your own. How can you swear by a life that you don't own? He said, you belong to me. 1 Corinthians 6.20, he said, you have been bought with a price, price of blood. He said, you're not your own. How can you swear? How can you swear by yourself? It's not your, not even your property. He said, you really are my property. You are God's property. We who have trusted Christ belong to him. As Jesus looked around, he said, you belong to me. You represent me. There should be no deception in your words. There should be uh, no word games. There should be no twisting of the words to have them come out the way you want them to come out. There should be truth, he says. That's God's standard. Truth. And that's the standard that all of us who know Jesus Christ desire. That is what should be in our hearts. That we desire truth in our hearts. Therefore, Jesus says in verse 37, let your statement, let your words be honest. He said, let your words be dependable. Let them be sincere. He says, verse 37, let your words be yes, yes, no, no. If it is yes, just say yes. If it is no, just say no. There's no need to complicate it. He said, that is the standard for my disciples. He said, anything else, he says, anything else, he said, is wrong. You know, I, I sometimes wonder, and I know we've all done this, when the conversation starts and somebody says to you, to tell you the truth, and I wonder, does that mean they're in the habit of telling lies and I just caught them on a good day? <laughs> We've all done that. All of our words would be true. All of the time. Jesus says in verse 37, anything beyond this, anything beyond words of truth is of evil. Admit it. I'll admit it. We've all fallen short. We have all fallen short of that standard. We have all lied. We may not call it lies all the time, but they are lies. We've all shaded the truth. We've all misrepresented things. We've all done that. Jesus says it is of evil. Paneros. In Greek, paneros, that's a strong word. He says it is wicked. Uh, it is worthless. They are words that devour and kill and destroy. That's a powerful word. They are lies that come from who? The father of lies. James 5.12 says, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath. Let your yes be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. Chrysus, chrysus in Greek, not paduo, which would mean chastening, which we would expect for a believer. He says, no, chrysus, eternal judgment. Does that mean that we who know Christ, his disciples, if we speak incorrectly or foolishly, or if our conversation doesn't honor the Lord... Does that mean we're in danger of eternal judgment? We know that isn't true because we know we are saved from unrighteousness by the blood of Christ. And we rest in that. But, James says, I have a warning for you. If it's your habit to carelessly use the name of the Lord in vain, 
without meaning, to profane his name, to use his name to justify your lies. He says, if that's your habit, you would be wise to examine yourselves. He says, you would be wise to truly see if you are in the faith, if you truly do belong to Christ. And that's where you might find yourself today. I know that's where Peter found himself, out in the courtyard. Just know that he will forgive you. He forgives us. He cleanses us. He restores us. He brings us back to himself, just like he did Peter. Psalm 23, the psalmist said, He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. He does it. He revives me. He strengthens me. He forgives me. He leads me in obedience. Why? Because he is a God of mercy and he desires to be merciful to you and to me. Even as his disciples, we are all men and women of unclean lips. But when we cry out to him, he restores us. He brings us back. Who else could do that? Who else could bring us back when we wander off the path? Who else? The one who seeks us. The one who finds us. The good shepherd who gave his life for us, the sheep of his pasture. Who else could do that? As his disciples, as those who belong to him, we have no argument with that. We long to speak words of truth. That is what we want to do. In Luke 6.45, Jesus says the words that we speak, we speak from that which fills our hearts. And our hearts are filled with the desire to be honest before him. To be real. To speak words that are true. And when we don't, when we blow it, we weep and we mourn because we know we've disgraced our Lord again. And he forgives us. And he restores us. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ is unlike anything else on earth. Unlike anything else. People talk about being disciples of this one or that one. They're just followers. We don't follow a set of rules and regulations. The standard that we follow is the standard in our hearts. That is the difference. It's a standard that we are continually in the process of learning. A process of learning to live in a way that pleases him. And it's a process that takes our entire lifetime until we're home with him. So don't be discouraged. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has given us a way to examine ourselves. It's not a bunch of set of rules and regulations. You can't take pieces of it out of context and come up with some doctrine about it. That's not what it was meant to be. It's a way for us to look at ourselves as disciples of Christ. It's a way for us to put ourselves in the examples that Jesus gives us, to put ourselves in those situations. And he invites us to see how we are handling things in those situations. How do we handle those things? Verse 38, he continues to teach his disciples and he says, You have heard it said, an eye for an eye. And a tooth for a tooth. And we've all heard that expression. In the Bible, Exodus 21, Leviticus 24, uh, Deuteronomy 19, we read that God gave Moses this law and Moses gave it to the people. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, limb for limb, life for life was the same kind of law that the Babylonian king Hammurabi, who lived a hundred years before Moses, gave to his people. But it wasn't designed to be cruel or vindictive. Some people think that. That's not, that wasn't the purpose of it. It was designed to bring order and to bring stability to the nation. It was to let the people know that sin, that crime, that 
It had consequences. There was punishment. It was a, an attempt to stop personal retaliation for anything that was done wrong. When we're hit, we want to hit back. We don't want to hit back one stuff. We want to hit back twice. Maybe three times. Maybe four times. Maybe kick them on the way down. Why? Because we want to make sure they get the message. Don't hit me anymore. That's the way we are. But this wasn't a law of Moses for the individual. It wasn't to give them a guide of how to handle things. This was a guide to the government, to the civil authorities. Moses was saying, here's how you handle these situations. Let the punishment fit the crime. Let justice be carried out according to the process of the law. The world's full of evil. You know that. I know that. We see it all around us. The law has been given to restrain that evil. The law has been given to governments to carry out, to regulate, to bring some kind of order. Paul in Romans 13 said, the law, the government is a minister for our good. But that's not the way the scribes and Pharisees interpreted the law. They saw it as an opportunity for revenge. They saw it as an opportunity for personal revenge that was sanctioned and approved by God, and they had the scripture to prove it. They thought that they were given the right by God. They twisted his word. So verse 39, Jesus says, I say to you, Don't believe the misinterpretation of this law by the scribes and Pharisees. Don't believe it has to do with revenge. He says, you're my disciples. You're to follow a different path. You know, without Christ, the best that we can hope for is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth because that means justice has been done. That means the punishment has fit the crime. It has been appropriate. It's been fair. If we get that, we'd be happy. But for those of us who are saved, those of us who know Christ, we're to be different. Jesus says we're to react differently. We're to react differently to the people who come into our lives. We're to react differently to the circumstances that come on us. Take up your cross, he said. Follow me. Verse 39, Jesus says, do not resist him who is evil. Anthestemai. Don't resist the one who is set against you. The one who opposes you. This is a passage of scripture that's had a lot of uh, discussion back and forth over the years. What does that mean? Does that mean we're not to oppose evil in the church? 1 Corinthians 5.13 says, remove the wicked man from your congregation. Remove him from among yourselves. Does that mean we're not to oppose evil of Satan and those who represent him? 1 Peter 5.9 says, resist him. Resist firm in the faith. And James 4.7 says, resist the devil and he will flee. That is not what Jesus is talking about here. What he is talking about are the abuses of the scribes and the Pharisees. He's talking about a heart that is full of the desire for revenge. A heart that is full of resentment and bitterness. A heart that seeks retaliation. A pound of flesh. Romans 12, 17, Paul said, Never, never pay back evil for evil. What did he say? Instead, he said, overcome evil with good. That is the attitude we're to have, Jesus said, as his disciples. We have been created in the image of God, all of us. We should have respect for each other because of that. But now in the real world, we know that's not always the case. And for a variety of reasons, it's not the case. We're not always treated fairly. We're not always treated right. And many times it's because we belong to Jesus Christ, just because we're following him. So if we are a disciple of Christ, count on it. Expect it. It will happen. 
Matthew 10.22 says, Jesus said, you'll be hated on account of me. John 16.2, uh, he said, they'll make you outcasts. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I guess this wouldn't do well in the newspaper as an advertisement for disciples, would it? You will be hated, you will be an outcast, you will be persecuted. Sign up today. No, it shouldn't surprise us when we're mocked. It shouldn't surprise us when we're laughed at or rejected or hated. Jesus compares it to a slap in the face. To the Jewish people, a slap in the face was considered a horrible insult. It was to be thought of as less than human. And that is what Jesus says persecution is. He says it's like a slap in the face. He says whoever, in verse 39, slaps you on the right cheek, whoever treats you viciously, who attacks you, who dishonors you, who disrespects you, who disdains you, Jesus says don't be like the Pharisees. Don't look at this evil attack as an opportunity for retaliation. He says, no. He says, verse 39, turn the other. Turn the other cheek. Don't retaliate. It's not so much what we are to do. It is what we are not to do. We are not to retaliate. Verse 5, Matthew 5, we read, those who belong to Christ are gentle in spirit. Meek, not weak. We are to surrender our power, and we have power. But we are to surrender it to God. We are to entrust ourselves to God as Jesus entrusted himself to God. First Peter 2, 23, it says, While being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats. But what did he do? It said he kept entrusting himself to God. Isaiah 50, verse 6, 800 years before Christ. We have the words of Christ there. He says, I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who rip out my beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. That is how we turn the other cheek. We entrust ourselves to God. And if we do that, Peter says in 1 Peter 2, if we do what is right and we suffer for it and patiently endure it, Peter says, God is pleased with us. That's not the way the world thinks. That's not the way that many in the church think today. But that is the way God thinks. And that is how the true disciples of Christ are to think. Jesus goes on. If that wasn't enough. I can't believe that this entire, went through this entire sermon in one shot. He says in verse 40, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, if you find yourself in court and there's a judgment against you, a decision uh, where you have to pay money or a fine and it's a debt and you don't have the money to pay it, the court could demand your shirt, your undergarment, your chiton, your tunic. So that they could demand that as part of the restitution, the payment. Literally the shirt off your back. But, he said, verse 40, give him your coat also. Your hema. Your robe. The court couldn't demand that. The court wasn't allowed to take your robe. Not only was the robe important because it was a garment, it was important because it was a blanket at night. So the court couldn't take that. Jesus says, no. If it will settle the problem, if it will settle the debt, if it will set things right, Give what is valuable to you. Give what you don't have to give so that you right the wrong. You correct the problem so that you demonstrate as my disciples that you are men and women of integrity. That's what we're to be. That's the principle there. We're to be men and women of integrity. And, he says in verse 41... Whoever shall force you to go a mile, go with him too. According to Roman law, 
A Roman soldier could force a citizen to carry his pack for the distance of a million in Greek. A Roman mile, a little less than our mile. You might be out in the field working. You might be on your way to dinner. You might have just finished work and you're on your way home and you're exhausted. But you were obligated to comply with the demand of that soldier. As you might expect, people hated carrying the equipment of their enemy. He doesn't deserve it. Well, yes, that's true, he doesn't. But do we deserve the mercy that God's shown us? We're to show other people mercy because of the mercy that Christ has shown us. Not because they deserve it. We didn't deserve it. Romans 5, 8 says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is mercy. That is mercy. So Christ says, use these situations, these unpleasant situations, as opportunities. Go beyond what is expected of you. Go the second mile. Go with joy in your heart. And go because you go in the name of Christ. Because you represent him. Verse 42. Jesus says, Now we're going to hit home. Now we're going to talk about your wallet, your pocketbook. It says, if somebody comes to you with a genuine need, not something foolish or something selfish, we need discernment to know the difference. It says, but if somebody comes to you and the situation is difficult, we're to respond to that plea for help with help. It's simple. Verse 42, he says, Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Don't ignore the need, the genuine need that has been placed right in front of your face. First John 3.17, it says, Whoever has the world's goods and beholds his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? That is a good question. As we walk as disciples of Christ, you're getting the idea, Jesus is saying, here's how you walk as my disciples. Yes, you make mistakes. Yes, you sin. But you confess those sins. And I forgive you. And you get up and you continue to walk. So what is hindering us in our walk? What's hindering us as we walk for him? What's getting in our way? Is it our words? Our mouth? Well, yes. Sometimes it is. Is it our pride? Well, maybe. Or is it our rights? The rights we think we have? Is it our selfishness? Is it our wallets? Is it our money? Is that getting in the way? The answer, yes, yes. Yes to all of the above. It all gets in the way. Why? Because we are getting in the way. That's the problem. We are getting in the way of ourselves. Galatians 2.20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. That is how we live as a disciple of Christ. We are gone. Who we were without Christ, our sin has been nailed to the cross. It has been nailed to the cross with Christ. And now we've been given a new life. We have a new life in him. We're a new creation. That is who we are. And that is how we live for him. That is the only way we can live for him. That is why only those who belong to Jesus Christ, who have his spirit living within them, can be disciples of Christ. It's not a matter of following. It's a matter of being. It's a matter of being his. So we yield to him. We depend on him. We don't strive to live for him. We believe that he lives. We trust that he lives in us and that his life is lived through us. You've been 
listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Borean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.